Thanks, Mia, and uh, welcome, everybody. Today, we're talking about data preparation and graphics. And uh, this is a great webinar to give, and I think I'm really happy you're here for it because I think you all know, if you're here, that preparing your data is a big part of what we do. Uh, just getting the data in the right format, getting the data clean and, and clear of outliers, and uh, making sure that we verify that we have all the right kinds of data, that's a huge part of what we do. And Jump's really fantastic for making that process a little bit easier. And so what I want to do first is uh, tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover today and uh, really what we're going to see. Uh, we're going to look at screening and cleaning, so the process of looking through your data set to uh, remove outliers and to um, clean those outliers. We're going to look at the process of subsetting and merging your data set. Uh, we're going to look at some reshaping techniques in Jump. And then finally, I'm going to show you some uh, resources at the Jump Academic Community. And actually, I want to start by showing you this uh, because this is where the recording of today's webinar will be. And so the Jump Academic Community is at jump.com slash JAC, Jump Academic Community. And it looks like this if you haven't seen it before. And it has featured resources. We have uh, recently posted resources, collections along the left-hand side. Uh, you can join the community and follow us. Um, but I want to point you to one section here, the collection of recent academic webinars, because that's where today's webinar will be. And so if I show you anything you want to try again, certainly go and check that out. And you can watch and you know pause and do it on your own. So jump.com slash JAC. And I'll show you that at the end of today's webinar as well. All right, so let's jump into uh, what we're going to talk about today. We want to start with the first section here, screening and cleaning. Uh, really some of the most tedious parts of uh, data preparation, but really can be kind of fun and uh, really is a little bit of an art form. I always like to think of this as, as the part of statistics that requires your most content knowledge, uh, since you need to really understand what type of data you have and uh, what your expectations are for the data set. And so I'm going to bring up a sample data file here. It's called Serial. And uh, hopefully you've seen some of our other webinars and you've seen the sample data before. If you haven't, uh, just so you can get to this if you're trying it on your own, under the Help menu is the Sample Data Library. And under there you can find all of our sample data sets. There's almost 500 of them. And uh, Serial is a fun one because it lists for these 76 serials uh, different attributes of them. And so supposing that these were data we collected, maybe some, some random sample of uh, serials out there, uh, we may want to investigate whether these observations or these serials uh, really represent the, the population we're interested in. And so let's start with the idea of screening for outliers. And there's some, some sort of domains in which we can do this. And, and the idea of outliers, I'll just say in general, is one of these um, sort of larger philosophical ideas within data. So you know, a point cannot be simply classified as an outlier or not without knowing the context that you're operating in. And so what I'm going to be showing you here are some techniques for, for potentially locating outliers. But only you can decide whether something really is or is, is not uh, an outlier. That's really an epistemic question. But so we can think about different methods for at least detecting possibilities of outliers. And the two sort of techniques or domains of techniques I want to talk about are, are univariate screening procedures and multivariate. And by this I mean procedures that really think about each variable one at a time, univariate approaches, and then approaches that really think about the, the constellation of variables you're using. So trying to locate observations that maybe uh, have strange or peculiar uh, sort of locations within the respect of all the variables you're using. So let's start with univariate outliers. And, and the best place that I always find to start is the distribution platform. And if you've used Jump, I'm sure you've seen the distribution platform. If you haven't, it's under the Analyze menu. And it's really the place that I always like to start with any data set that I'm working with. It is actually the best way to get to know what data you have. And so I'm going to launch the distribution platform. And my standard procedure is take every variable I have in the data set and I'll only say I won't do this sometimes if I have thousands of rows and a unique identifier. I may delete that. So I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to take out the name since I'm going to presume that the name column is OK. But I'll cast everything else into the Y role and click OK. And what we get is our histograms. And if you're new to Jump, you may be surprised that histograms are on their side. Uh, you can always change that under the top red triangle by going to Stack. Uh, but I'm going to keep them on their side because this lets me see the most on my screen all at once. And really at this first stage, what we're doing is we're looking at the distributions or the, the observations in each column uh, in a univariate sense. Now, those of you who have used Jump know these are interactive, so I can click on, let's say, a bar, Quaker Oats here, and I can see those observations in every other histogram. Uh, but principally, we're looking at these variables one at a time. And what I want to screen for or look for as I go across uh, is different depending on the type of data I have. 
So the categorical columns, what I'm really trying to investigate there is whether I have the right types of observations. So hot and cold here, I just have capital H and capital C. It would be a problem if I had some lowercase c's and lowercase H's, H's right? Because that would be miscoding. So for, for qualitative columns, I'm looking for, for basically whether things are miscoded. For numeric columns, what I want to look at is whether the, the distribution of the variable makes sense, uh, maybe has some problems that I'll have to work with later. So this is sort of bimodal. Um, but mostly whether I see outliers, whether I see points that are so far from the center uh, that it would lead me to think that they aren't representative of the population that I'm sampling from. Now, if you're new to Jump, you may not have known that you can use under the Tools menu this Graver tool uh, to actually change the bin sizes dynamically. So if I have the Graver tool selected, I can click on the bars and I'll drag to the right to make the bins smaller. And I like to do this for some of my variables. It lets me sort of see a little bit more of the, uh, the characteristics of the distribution. So I'll just do this a couple times. And then I'll go back and select my arrow key or my arrow tool. Now for calories, you do notice there's sort of two big clumps here. So a clump that have lower calorie cereals and maybe another clump up here. So that may be something we want to think about uh, in analysis. Uh, protein looks okay. When we get to fat, however, we notice that in our, our box plot plot over here, we have some points that are shown. And points that are shown means that they have excluded, or uh, sorry, um, are beyond rather the outer fence. And so they've exceeded the outer fence. And the outer fence being this point right here. And so that's one and a half times the inner quartile range, the distance from here to here, uh, plus the third quartile. And so it's a distance that's far enough from the median that it's sort of thought to be an outlier procedure to detect those, those points. And so these points are pretty far from the median, right? So those are high fat cereals relative to the rest of the distribution. And uh, if you've never seen Jump before, by selecting points here, you'll notice that they're also selected in the data set. And this is handy for identifying uh, which observations these were, but it also has a really nice feature, which is that we can operate on these points right now. And this is sort of my first uh, tip here, is once you've found points, or found points you may want to investigate later, uh, we need to do something to remember these points or to uh, work with them. So if I right click, we get our rows menu, so our rows option. And there's a couple that I'll point out to you that I like to do. Uh, the first is applying markers. And so we can apply a marker to these points. Let me give them a star here. And what this will do is now apply that marker to the data set. Notice it's part of the row state. And which also means that whenever I go into any other graphics, it's going to have that point marked. So no matter what graphic I use, I'll just go and do a, a quick 3D scatter plot here of a couple of variables. And notice that even in the 3D format, uh, those points get marked. And the value of this is that if now when we're looking later on at sort of graphs and we see something uh, anomalous, uh, we can identify those points for ourselves. So marking the points is one nice thing to do. Again, selecting them, right-clicking, and going to the row marker. Now, if you're sure that they're wrong data, so for instance, we had a fat measurement that was 170, right? that would be so far beyond the center that it would lead us to think it's incorrect, we can actually grab that point and just do a hide and exclude. So hiding means that it's removed from visuals, from, from graphs, and excluding means that it's not used in calculations. So we can do both at once, so row hide and exclude. Now, another thing we can do, uh, since I don't like to remove points right away, I like to just leave trails for myself to use them later. Uh, my favorite is this name selection in column. And what this operation does is with the points selected there, name selection in column gives me a dialog. And I can name this dialog, I'll say high fat. And what it's going to do is, if I have a point selected, this new column will have a value of 1 for those points and a value of 0 for the other points. So let's see what happens here. I'll click OK. If I go to my data set, notice we have this new column, high fat, and the ones that are selected, of course, have a 1. And this is handy for a couple reasons. If I'm in the data set and I simply want to select all the high fat cereals, I can right click that cell and there's this option, select matching cells. And so it'll just select all the high fat cereals again for me. And so it's a nice operation we can use to get those back in our selection set. Also, we can use this column as a filter later on in our analysis. And I'll show you what that looks like. The value of naming a selection in column is also that as I go across, notice these points I have selected, the starred ones, they don't necessarily have to be the outliers in other variables, which is the issue with univariate outlier detection. The outliers with respect to fat may not be the same outliers with respect to, let's say, fiber. So these two cereals here, and I'll just hover and you can see what they are. And so one is all brand with extra fiber and one is fiber one. So these two points are not the same outliers. So maybe I want to give them a different marker. I'll give them, let's say, a big block square here. And let me do the same name selection. I'll do right-click, 
name selection and column. And this one I'll call, instead of high fat, I'll call it high fiber. And give it a one again if it's selected and a zero if not. And notice what I've done is now I've created two columns that identify selections. And this is actually quite handy. I can do differential selections based on these, or maybe depending on which uh, variables I'm using in an analysis, I can use these as exclusion criteria. And so name selection and column is actually a very useful operation. So again, in the univariate sense, what we're looking for are observations that would lead us to think that those points are not representative of the population from which we drew the sample. Or at the very least, they don't represent the population we wish to draw inferences about. Remember, the whole point of our statistical process of sampling here is to take observations that would lead us to good inferences about the greater population out there. If all we care about is this particular data set, well, then those points are fine. But if they're going to contort our observation or our recovery of what is true in the world, then we need to do something with them. And so that's principally what we're looking for here, things that may contort our perception of truth. So as I go across, you see that we do find that some outliers are the same. So calories from fat, those are the ones that were high fat, and that sort of makes sense. But as we go across, things look actually pretty much okay. Some of these distributions are kind of skewed. Um, that's not necessarily a problem with the data. It may be a violation to assumptions, but that's something we can come back to. Uh, but for the most part, things are looking pretty well behaved here. And so we may not need to do much else. All right, so that's in a univariate sense. That was a univariate outlier detection method. Uh, but let's actually look at different ways we can do this, uh, and specifically a multivariate outlier detection procedure I want to tell you about. And before I get to that, let's actually step back and think about when we're doing something in a multivariate way, we are in a sense imposing some sense of a model on the data. And so all multivariate detection procedures at the root of it have to make some assumption about what we think is out there in the population such that we can detect what's different from what we expect. And the multivariate procedure I'm going to show you right now is presuming something about the distributions being jointly distributed. And let me sort of give you a sense of what that means. I'm going to use a different platform now, sort of the generalization of the distribution platform under multivariate methods, multivariate. This is one of my favorite platforms because what this lets us do is instead of looking at variables individually, it's going to let us look at them jointly and to see their interrelationships and by doing so, see what things may be or points may be uh, aberrant relative to their joint distributions. Now, to do this, I'm going to make a choice here. Uh, some of my columns, you may have seen, are, are somewhat derivative of other columns. For instance, calories is really just a linear transformation of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And so I'm actually going to leave that out. Um, protein, fat, sodium, and fiber, these are all indiv independent information. Uh, complex carbohydrates and uh, total carbohydrates and sugars, these all sort of have uh, sort of similar information. I'm going to keep sugars in there, but I'll leave total carbohydrates out. Uh, calories from fat is just a linear transformation of really fat and multiplied by calories amount from fat. And uh, potassium I'll put in. So notice what I'm doing is I'm sort of leaving out variables that are, are, are you know, combinations of other variables. And the reason I'm doing this is when I want to look at them in a multivariate way, I'm trying to see which points in this distribution, really which serials, are strange with respect to some uh, center among all these variables. And so when I hit OK, let's, let's orient ourselves first. This is the basic multivariate uh, platform output. And it starts with a cor correlation matrix. So if you look across, let's say, for this first column here, so protein correlates with itself at a value of 1. So correlation with itself is 1. Uh, with fat, 0 0.40. With sodium, very little. So you can see you can look across and sort of see the correlations between protein and everything else. Uh, similarly, you can look down and see the correlation between protein and everything else. And the uh, matrix here is really symmetric. So across this diagonal, we're seeing the same correlations. Uh, but it's a nice lookup table. So we can see any variable correlated with anything else for really easy. So fiber with carbohydrates, right, 0.17. So in our scatterplot matrix, we're seeing essentially the same thing, but it's each variable plotted against each other variable. And inside of each of these, so let's say protein and fat here, what we're seeing is the points. Notice the points I, I colored or marked before are still marked. We're seeing a density ellipse, and so that's showing us on sort of an orthogonal fit between the variables uh, as the major axis, and the sort of the degree to which the major axis is longer than the minor is showing us the degree to which the variables are correlated. And so when we have a full circle, uh, that's really showing that variables aren't correlated with each other. Uh, when we have variables like this, so fiber and potassium, so a really narrow sort of oblong uh, ellipse there, that shows the variables are pretty correlated. So we can embellish this plot a little bit. I'm going to go to the red triangle and actually show the correlations. 
I'm going to show the histograms. This is kind of neat. I'll put them on the horizontal so we can see the histograms. And if we want, we can do other things like fitting a line or shading the ellipses. I actually like to do this too, a nice shaded version. And so we can embellish this plot. But remember, what we're looking for in the multivariate sense is which points don't make sense sort of relative to their relationship with all the other variables. And so I'll give you a sense of what I mean. Let's just look at a couple of these all at once. So protein and fat. The points are marked here. Notice that they were strange relative to fat, right? They were pretty high fat to begin with. But not only that, they're sort of outside the points uh, in the ellipse here. That is, they're sort of strange with respect to the relationship between protein and fat. Let's look at another one. So over here, these fibers, right? They weren't just high in fiber, right, being high on this axis here. They were actually outside the ellipse as well. So they were kind of strange with respect to the relationship between protein and fiber. Now, there are points that we didn't mark before looking in a univariate sense. For instance, let's say this one here, all brand. Like this was pretty high with fiber and pretty high with potassium, but we didn't mark it. It wasn't uh, a, you know, beyond whatever our threshold was before. But it is sort of outside the relationship between the variables. Same thing over here with this point. So there's a sense that we can think about outlying this as not just outlying with respect to a single variable, but sort of strange with respect to the relationship among variables. My favorite example is, let's say you're in a restaurant and you're collecting data and you find a table where somebody tipped $10. Well, that might be uh, totally normal relative to the distribution of tips. And you also find that that person had a bill of $10. Well, maybe that's not strange relative to all the bill amounts in your restaurant, but that person would have tipped 100%. So with uh, respect to the relationship between bill amount and tip amount, usually it has a slope about, you know, let's say 0.20% or 20%, um, that point would be strange because it's, it's outside the relationship among the variables. And so what we want to do in this multivariate way is capture all at once how far points are uh, from sort of a centroid. So if we're talking about a multivariate mean or a multivariate center, we're talking about a centroid, and we want to find distance from that centroid but scaled relative to the relationships we see in the data set. And I'll give you a 3D representation of this quickly, and then we'll sort of look at them all together. Let's just pick three variables by default. So if we look at you know, the elaboration of the 2D version, so points that are sort of outside the 3D ellipsoid, you know, our fat or uh, sort of serials are still marked there. So this is three dimensions, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables here. So we want to look at sort of a seven dimensional representation of outlyingness. And we can't really reflect that in a 3D plot or a 7D plot, but what we can do is reduce it down to a 2D plot. And so this is under the outlier analysis section of that red triangle. And it's based off of an idea called the Mahalanobis distance. And a Mahalanobis distance is just what I said before. It is a distance measure of points relative to a center in multivariate space, so a centroid, scaled or sort of uh, stretched or compressed on the basis of the relationships among variables, just like tip amount and bill amount, right? We know there's some relationship between those two and we can observe what that is in the data set so we can sort of scale how distant a point is from the centroid on the basis of what we know about the relationships. And so I'm gonna reveal the Mahalanobis distance and what you get is this little control chart and I'll just stretch it out here on the side and what we're looking at is every point in the data set, the x-axis is row number. So if I select this first point, that's literally the first row in the data set. And the last point is the last row. And then the y-axis is really the important point. That's the distance measure, the Mahalanobis distance. And so it's a sort of a, a overall distance measure that's been summed over all the different relationships. And if I select a point, let's say this point right here, the most extreme one, this is the point that in essence makes the least sense relative to where all the data are. And if you look at that point in all of these um, bivariate plots, you can see it's typically the one that is outside of the relationship. Well, it's not always, so fiber and carbohydrates, it's kind of in the middle, but for the most part, it's either uh, outside of the ellipse or sort of near the edge. And so it's the sort of least likely point or the least expected point relative to the relationships. If we grab a point that's sort of down at the bottom, those are the most expected location. That's the point that's dead center of all of these relationships. And so that's sort of the, the canonical uh, average serial. So the most average serial we found is life, 
So that's a cereal that's sort of the most mundane by this statistical measure, uh, perhaps by our, our taste measure too. So Mahalanobis distance is a great way to capture these all at once. And again, since I can select the points, I'll just grab the points that are above this upper control limit. That's sort of a line that says, you know, given a, an assumption about the distribution in the population, in this sense, it's a multivariate normal. That's sort of the, the extent to which we should expect most of our data points to fall points beyond that line are a little bit suspect. They're points that are a little strange relative to the sort of total distributions. And so I can grab those points and I can just right click and I can do my same operations. I can give them markers, I can exclude them, or, and this is again a great use for this, name selection and column. And I'll call this multivariate. And I'll give them a one if they're selected and a zero if not. I'm not gonna call them an outlier, it's just maybe multivariate uh, strange points and I'll give them a selection. And so notice I get that in my data set again. And so this is nice because now when we start doing analyses, we can include or not include these points based on high fat, high fiber, or the ones that are strange relative to the total distribution. And so again, the steps for this was just launching the multivariate platform, going to outlier analysis, and selecting the Mahalanobis distance. Now there's a couple sort of elaborations on this I'll point out. So a jackknife distance and a t-squared are, are sort of transformations of a Mahalanobis. So a t-squared is just the Mahalanobis squared, which sort of illuminates or, or shows a little more in detail the points that are really extreme. Jackknifing is a really interesting idea. So what jackknifing does, and I'll reveal it here, it's going to look just like the Mahalanobis control chart. So it's very similar. I'll even stretch it out so it's similar. Uh, but what it's going to do, I'll try stretching it again. Here we go. But what it's going to do is when it calculates the Mahalanobis distance for each point, it is going to not use that point when it's calculating the multivariate mean or the centroid. So what that means is when it calculated the Mahalanobis distance for this first one, 100% nuts, bran, oats, and honey, it didn't use that data point to calculate the covariance matrix, so sort of what the correlation matrix is based off of, nor did it use that point to find the mean. And the reason that's valuable is occasionally you have outliers that are so extreme that it will contort what you think about the covariances and about the multivariate mean. This is especially true in small data sets. You know, I only have 76 observations here, so each point can actually exert a pretty large amount of leverage or a large amount of influence on the uh, correlations and the multivariate mean. So jackknifing as a procedure says, don't use the point under question to calculate all the, the other things and then look at the distance of that point to the center relative to the covariances, not using that point in the calculation. So you only use it to find the distance, but not to find everything else. And so what you'll typically find with jackknifing is if you have an outlier, not like this, maybe something that would have a Mahalanobis of 100, something really extreme, uh, it will actually look even more extreme. So it won't allow itself to be hidden by the fact that it ex sort of contorts the view of whatever uh, thing else looks like sort of along the way. And so jackknifing is a really nice procedure. I kind of prefer that, especially with small data sets. All right, so that was a basic multivariate way of looking at influence or looking at outlying this. I want to show you one other, and this is sort of a, a direct model-based or influence measure uh, to look at um, outlying this or to look at outliers. And I'm just going to do this rather quickly under fit model. If you're working, let's say, within a multiple regression, and we're trying to predict something, let's say we're trying to see how sugars relate to uh, some of these other attributes, so a model in which we have, let's say, protein, fat, sodium, fiber, you know, a number of, of variables that are in our model effects. I'm going to run this model, and we're going to get an output, but before we interpret the output, one thing that I always like to look at is the degree to which observations in our data set are influencing sort of the magnitude of the parameters. And a really nice measure is under the red triangle, and you go under row diagnostics, um, or sorry, it's under save columns here. So under save columns, we get this Cook's D influence. And Cook's de-influence, uh, even tooltip tells, tells us, how much influence each observation has in the estimation of our model terms. And by going to save columns, this will actually save this measure to our data set. And so let me just go to distribution so we can look at the, uh, the Cook's de-influence across uh, all of our variables here. And I'll actually go to stack so we actually look at it on its side for this one. Uh, but what we're looking at is for every point in the data set, I'll actually go to Tools, get the grabber, and, and drag this up, too. We're looking at the degree to which each point is actually influencing the relationship we observe. So in that, that uh, multiple regression, uh, we're looking at how much each point is really contributing or, or affecting 
each one of these parameter estimates. And our values are actually all pretty low. Um, the really sign of a problem here would be if we have a Cook's D maybe above 1. Uh, none of ours are above you know, even 0.14 or 0.15 here, so we're actually OK. Uh, but you'll sometimes have points that are, are severely contorting the relationship. So uh, really, this Cook's D is a measure of how much your parameters would have changed had a point not been in, uh, actually included in the model. And so notice that two of the points we marked before, one of them that was high fiber and one of them was high fat, uh, those have the most influence, but not an un undue amount of influence. So even though they are, are beyond or sort of unexpected in our distributions, uh, they're not changing our parameter estimates terribly. And so again, that's going to be under our red triangle here, under save columns, when we're actually fitting a model using fit model. And so that's actually very nice to look at uh, before we start interpreting parameter estimates. All right, so that was just a, a basic set of things we can do for screening for outliers. But sometimes our data sets aren't uh, clean in another way. Sometimes we're actually missing the variables we wish we had. And this can be because we didn't collect them, which is a real problem. Uh, it can also be because we need to transform or otherwise change variables that are in our data set. And so let's talk for a second about the idea of making new variables. And making new variables is, is as easy and jump as, as selecting columns and right-clicking. We have sort of instant formulas. Uh, or we can do it through a formula editor. And so let me just show you, for any new column you create or any column you already have, you can right-click that column and select formula. And the formula editor is great because what we can do is create formulas that are based on uh, variables that are in our data set, so simple arithmetic based on them. And we also have uh, lots of functions that can operate on these. And certainly, uh, a total sort of coverage of this is well beyond the scope of today's webinar. But I want you to see a couple of these that are really important. And so certainly, uh, transcendental functions, so if you're taking logs or exponentiating, um, trigonomic functions are all in here as well. Uh, you can actually do some advanced conditional logic, and we'll see that in just a little bit. Uh, but you can really operate on your variables in a sophisticated way by defining formulas. And it's all point and click if you want, or you can actually write JSL code here. And so let me give you an example of why we might want to make a formula in this data set. Uh, notice that in our data set we have uh, cups per serving here. And notice that not all of our cereals actually have the same serving amount. So we may want to look at some of our variables uh, rescaled based on what they would have as far as their components or their contents if they had one cup worth. So for instance, I could take something like fat, hit the divide sign, and do, uh, let's scroll down, cups per serving. And when I click apply, Notice what it does is now we get a new column. Our new column is populated with the values, how many uh, grams of fat we would have had we actually had one whole uh, or per cup. So if we look at this first one, so if we go across to fat here, it had 0.5 grams of fat in this 0.33 cups worth. But had we actually had a whole cup full, it'd be 1.5. And so we can actually call this by double click. So fat per cup. So maybe this is a measure we want to use instead of the original fat. And if I look at the distribution of it, let's actually see, we actually find that some of our cereals that were high fat before are now really high fat. So if they had the exact same quantity, uh, we'd actually maybe see that they are really extreme. And so creating these derived variables are really useful. Sometimes we actually need to do this to get access to the, the right information in our data set. Now we can define the formula like I did there, right click and select formula, or, and this is actually a very useful thing, if we select columns in the data set, let's say let's do this again for potassium, I'll select potassium there, hold down, I'm on the Mac, so I'll hold down the command key and select cups per serving. If you're on the PC, you'll hold down control. So we have two of them selected, I can just right click column, go to new formula column, and if I want to take a ratio, that's an operation of combining the variables. So I'll go to combine and I'll do a ratio. Now ratio here in ratio of reverse order means take the first one divided by the second, that's ratio, and ratio reverse order is take the second divided by the first. So I want to do the first one, ratio, so potassium divided by uh, cups per serving. And so now I actually have it, it names it for me, potassium divided by cups per serving. And I can do this rather quickly for a number of our variables. I'll deselect potassium and do sugars, right click, new formula column, combine, ratio, let me do one more here. So I'll do instead of sugars, let me do uh, carbohydrates here. So total carbos. So right click, new formula, combine, take a ratio. 
And so now with these new columns, maybe I want to reinvestigate my distributions. And so again, go back to the univariate outlying idea and see whether now I've revealed some things. And actually for potassium, I have. There are some rows that before did not look very extreme, but now that I've scaled it relative to the amount per cup, actually maybe give me pause that these are actually really high potassium. And so deriving variables is a really important way to actually look at these sometimes. And so note that you can do them with your own formulas, so just right-clicking a column and going to formula, or let Jump write the formula for you. And so if I look at any of these columns, what Jump has done is created the exact same formula, potassium divided by cups per serving. So what I would have done if I was doing it myself. So that was formula editor and instant formulas. There's one other thing I want to show you, which are temporary formulas. And these are really useful. So let me go to Graph Builder, really my favorite graphing platform in Jump. And occasionally what we're doing is creating graphs, but we want to make uh, several graphs based on uh, variables we don't actually need to include in our data set, but we need for the purpose of graphing. And so let me show you one, one example of this. So one thing I like to do is take a lot of my columns. I'm going to drag them all into Y here. And I'm going to turn on box plots, and I want you to see something that Jump does. Jump will actually display the box plots all at once on this graph. But what you probably notice is that since the scales of these variables are all very different, some of my box plots are pretty useless to me. So looking at them down here, even though I can you know, still see the outliers, and that's actually one reason I would like to do this, um, they're just all squished. And so the scaling being so different for each variable is a problem. Well, many of you would think, well, just z-score those variables. Take a standardized version. Take each observation minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Take a z-score. Well, we can go through doing that in our data set. That's actually something you can do for each variable. So if I go back and, let's say, select one of these or multiple, right-click, new formula, distributional, and I can standardize. Well, I could do that, and it will add a column to my data set. Maybe I don't want the column in my data set. I just want to use it for the purpose of graphing. And we can do that. Let me select the columns in Graph Builder itself, actually in the launch window. I'll right click and notice we get the same menu. And if I go to Distributional and go to Standardize, this will create temporary variables that are used just in Graph Builder. Notice they haven't been added to my data set. So I have nothing over on the right hand side here. And you can tell that they're temporary because they're italicized. You can actually right click on them and say add to data table if you like. But I don't want to do that. I'm going to keep them in standardized form here in a temporary form drag them to Y, click the box plots, and now I can look at these all in z-space, so z-scored, so relative to their own distributions, sort of how extreme observations are. And the value of doing this is that now if I want to do sort of an overall grab every point that's beyond that outer fence, I can actually grab them on the same plot. In the distribution platform, this wasn't something you can do because each different uh, histogram sort of has a different selection. But in Graph Builder, by dragging them all to the y-axis and turning on the box plots, uh, these are all selectable all at once. And so maybe if you want to do a very quick procedure of grabbing all the points that are beyond that outer fence, uh, you can actually do it this way. And so that temporary standardization is actually really, really useful. And note that you can do all the same operations that you could do in the data set. So if I grab two of these, right click, remember I can do the ratios right here. And so you, actually in any launch window, this is true. So if I go to distribution, let's say, and you want to look at maybe the log of all of these variables. So again, transform, go to log, we can make some temporary variables. And so we don't have to actually uh, create them and add them to a data set. We can make them temporarily just to investigate sort of the consequences of transformations. And so those are temporary formulas, useful anytime in Jump you want to make a formula, uh, but not keep it around. Now finally, there's some other transformations or other ways of driving variables uh, that we often need to do. So for instance, if we're looking at calories, the distribution of calories, you know, maybe we want to, instead of thinking about this as a numeric quantity, you know, we're going from 50 to 250 here, maybe we want to break this apart into low, medium, and high calorie cereals. So we want to create bins for these observations instead of having the numeric quantities. Now, I don't want to get into uh, sort of the the pros and cons of binning, there are actually quite a few of them, and depending on sort of what you think about the data and its relationships, uh, this could be a good idea or a very bad idea. Uh, but let's just presume that you have a good reason to bin these into low, medium, and high calories. And so there's a couple ways to do this in Jump, and so I'll, I'll call these as interval binning, percentile binning, and then I want to show you an add-in that I really like for this. And so first, the simple way. If you right-click a column in the data set, go down to Utilities, there's this uh, make binning formula section. 
So again, right click in the data set, uh, utilities make bidding formula. And what this lets you do is set really just interval widths. So uh, set widths that'll actually create um, sort of bind low to high or whatever you want to name them here. Let me show you how this works. So the offset is really where this starts. So the first bin is going to start here. You can see at 49.5 to 99.5. The offset is automatically set to include the lowest observations. And then the width is how wide you want each bin to be. And so if I want low, medium, and high, and it goes from 50 to 250, well, that's 200. Let me make this something like, you know, 66. Maybe let's do 68. So a little bit of guess and check here. And now we have three bins. So 50 to 185. Uh, this one's 117.5 to 185.5. And then 17, or 185.5 to 253.5. And so these are making the three bins for me. They're equally sized bins. It doesn't mean that we have the same number of observations in each bin. But what it does mean is that our bins have equal width. And so what I'm going to do is create a formula column from this. That's what the make formula column button is going to do. And notice what we get now is this calories binned formula or column. And if I right click and go to the formula, you'll see what it's doing is it's simply doing a little bit of a sort of some clever JSL here. And it's sort of adding from the offset plus the width and creating a little formula for us. And so what this does is if now we're looking at, let's say, relationships, well, first let's look at the distribution of that variable. It's put observations into the bins. And now if, let's say, we were looking at some relationship between, I don't know, let's say protein on the basis of overall binned calories. So now we actually get the options of things like an ANOVA instead of doing something like a linear regression. And maybe that's important because maybe we think that only one category will have some effect and we don't want to really um, measure the, the linear relationship between something, but we want to model means. And so there's, again, positives and negatives to binning, uh, but certainly this is one way you can do it. So again, in the data set, right click, going to utilities, make bidding formula. Now, another way I want to show you is maybe you want to make uh, cutoffs based on percentiles. And uh, this is one way that works a lot better, especially when uh, your distributions are, are very skewed or there are situations where you don't need those equal widths. And I'm going to point you to an add-in that I really like. So originally written by uh, Jeff Perkinson and Ian Cox and some others, um, but then updated by Brady Brady on our technical enablement team. And it's called Interactive Binning. And so it's version 2 here. And so if you just search for Interactive Binning and Jump, you'll find this pretty quickly. Let me show you what this is going to do. So I'm going to go to my add-ins, Interactive Binning. And Interactive Binning uh, just starts off by asking us for a column. Let's use calories again to compare it to what we did before. And what we get is this little histogram, but we get a bar that we can drag around. That's what the dot lets me do, is move the bar around. And I can add cut points. So I can actually uh, interactively make my bins here. Now you can do it interactively. Maybe that's important if there's points you need to uh, specifically make cut points around, something very specific or something important, um, you know, either based on your content knowledge, you know, some threshold above which something counts as something else, whatever it is. Uh, or, and this is where I was going with percentiles, maybe you want to set the cut points at the lower 25% to the 50th percentile to the 75th to 100. So you want four equal bins, but set at, let's say, quarters of the data. And so let me do that. And what this will do is, as best it can, create cut points. And this is a small data set, so it doesn't do terribly well, but tries to set cut points such that you actually meet that the percentiles that you specified. And once you've done this, so go to the red triangle next to interactive binning, and uh, I can actually save a group column from this. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. And notice what this does is now it creates this calorie grouping uh, based on uh, percentile binning rather than binning with equal widths. And so again, the interactive binning tool is really useful, especially when you want to create those bins based on things other than just equal widths, or when you want to actually see the distribution and actually create uh, the bins that way. All right, so those were new variables and sort of a, a touch point or a touch on several tools in Jump to make new variables. Uh, certainly explore column formulas, really, really useful. Uh, let's take a quick look at cleaning. So I'm going to close this data set for us now. And let me look at a different data set. And to start this off, uh, let's actually do the thing that I suggested at the very start. Whenever you get a new data set, go to Analyze, Distribution, grab all your variables, click it into Y, and click OK. And the reason to do this again is for numeric columns to look whether you have numeric outliers or observations that would lead you to suspect something about those data points, and for the categorical columns to make sure things are coded correctly. 
Well, you may have seen already, I'm going to minimize some of these columns to sort of uh, show more uh, directly what I'm looking at here. Uh, for the categorical columns, we have some serious problems. So for credit card, right, in the data set, people have been entering it as yes and why, or no and n. So a pretty common mistake, but difficult for us in a uh, statistical standpoint, because as far as jump is concerned, those are different observations. And so uh, we need to group these together in some way. Uh, day of week is a bit of a mess, so people have entered it in all manner of different way. And server has a couple problems. Some people, uh, maybe at the start of uh, entering the data, or maybe some different entry uh, from different people, you know, uppercase, lowercase, or having server actually in the entry. And so there's a couple ways that we can clean these data up. Now, certainly, um, many of you maybe came from Excel or other software. Uh, you're used to using find and replace, and certainly that's something you can do in Jump. You can find and replace. Uh, but there's a much more useful tool in Jump to actually clean these data up. And so let's start with credit card. So under the columns menu, under utilities, there's the option of recode. And recode is really fantastic. And let me show you, I'm going to show you a couple different ways of using it for these three different columns. Now, the basic idea of recode is you have your old values and what new values you want those rows to have. And notice that uh, 99 of my rows are n's and only 7's are no. So I'm going to use n as the default. So I'm going to type n over here. And what you'll see jump does is group these together and now they're a little group. And that's because it noticed that those values collapse in on themselves. Now instead of retyping, I can drag a selection over the two I want to combine and I can right click and it gives me an option what I want to uh, relabel it as. I can group it to Y, group it to yes, or swap the values. Maybe those were miscoded because they should be uh, switched. Well, I'm going to group it to Y since we're using Y's and N's. Now once I'm done with this, I can hit the done button and you have a couple options. You can recode in place, make a new column that's static, make a formula column that it will recode dynamically even if you add new data, or write a script to the data table that will allow you to do this recoding on the basis of some scripting. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't actually suggest you do generally, just so you see what it does. I'm going to recode in place. And what this does in jump is writes over the existing values. Now, the danger of this is, let's say you do some recoding that's a little more complicated than what I just did, and months from now, you go back to this data set and realize, oh no, I shouldn't have recoded those things together. Well, you've lost all the data, right? You've recoded in place, and so you've actually written over those. Unless you have a stored version of the data set before recoding, uh, you're sort of out of luck. And so I would actually recommend not doing in place. And so for the next column, we're going to do something different. So for day of week, let's do it again. Columns, utilities, recode. And this time, rather than trying to select all the ones that are, are the same, which we could do, it's not that many, I'm going to go to the red triangle, and I'm going to select the option to group similar values. And this is a little bit of jump magic. What this will do is gives us options on what it can ignore between the different levels such that it can make them the same. So it can ignore case, non-printed characters, white space. So that's actually going to cover a lot of these. There's some white space here. It'll trim. Uh, it can actually ignore the punctuation and the actual case. So lowercase Friday and uppercase Friday will combine. But what it can also do is allow character edits, changing one letter to be a different letter. And I have it set on difference ratio here, so just the default. What this means is that it can change a quarter of each word or each one of these strings to be another string. And if it can do that, it's going to count them as the same. And what that means is when I click OK, it'll figure out that most of these are basically uh, changes of another one. And it does pretty well. All the Fridays are together. Thursdays are all together. Wednesdays, except for one, are all together. Because notice, Wednesday spelled out is too many characters different from lowercase Wednesday, or from just Wednesday as an abbreviation. So it didn't combine it. But that's okay. Let me just drag a selection over all these guys. Remember, I can right-click and group it to Wednesday, or to WED. And so now we're done. We've actually recoded all of these together. Now this time, I'm going to do recode, but as a formula column. And what a formula column will do is write to the data set a new column, so it won't write over the existing column. And what it will actually do is if I right click and go to formula, it's now written this as a formula using the match function, so some, some logic here. And this is great for a couple reasons. It's great first because, let me go down and make a new row, and let's say that uh, we've you know told people to stop entering data wrong, so stop entering things as lowercase. If they still do that, it's okay, because notice that this new column is able to recode that uh, on demand. And so it'll keep recoding those old values because it knows how to do the recoding. It has a match function. It looks in the previous column, looks for these values, and rewrites them as these values in the new column. 
if it finds a value that it can't recode, it'll just leave it as that uh, existing value. So if I enter something that's just too wrong, I enter Ted because I can't spell, it'll just keep it as Ted. And so that's something you always have to be aware of. But the nice thing is, if people just keep entering uh, things in the wrong way, but the same wrong way, it'll keep recoding. In addition to that value, you also have your recoding schema. If somebody asks you how you did your recoding, you can show them this. And in addition to that, if you decide later on that your recoding was wrong, so some category should not have been combined to another, uh, you can make that change. And so that's actually just a part of the data set that'll always stay there. Now finally, let me show you for server what happens if we write the other way, so writing it just as a new column. So I'm gonna go back to utilities recode. I'm gonna again, just make it easy on ourselves, go to the red triangle and group similar values. Now, again, like it did before, we're gonna have the problem that some of the servers, right, are so different from the original letters that it's gonna make a mistake. And so be careful with group similar values because notice it's using edit distance as an ability to change a word. And so server with the letter at the end, changing a quarter of that uh, string actually means it can become one of these other servers because B, C, and B is only one character different. And so this is a situation where you have to be a bit careful. Here's what I would do, grab server A, grab the A's here, right click, group to A, grab server B, grab the B's, right click, group to server B, and grab C, and C, and server C, right click, oops, right click over here, and group to server C. Now we have one stranded there, B's, let's actually grab it here, right click, group to B, that was an issue because they had different cases, and now we're okay, so we've actually recoded just fine. This time I'm gonna go to done and I'm gonna write a new column. So not in place, not a formula column, but a new column. And I want you to see what this will do is instead of writing a column with a formula, if I right click, notice there's no formula, what it's done is actually written this in such a way that if I enter in, let's say B here, this actually won't get recoded again. And so these data points are static. And the value of this is if you want to do a recoding one time and you're adding new data and you don't want it to continue that recoding, uh, for whatever reason, that's the way to do it. So write it as a static column. Now my preference and my suggestion is always writing as a formula column. Because if you want, you can always delete the formula and keep the values. Uh, but at least you have your, your sort of schema for recoding. So that's a good value there. All right, so that was just some screening and cleaning here. So again, the, the highlights are uh, using the distribution column and certainly looking for multivariate outliers and then deriving variables from your data set. All right, now there are times when your data come in different tables or you need to squish them together in some other way. And so um, let's actually start with the clean version of restaurant tips, the one that that data set came from I was just working with. Now let's say you're in a situation where you have servers A, B, and C in this data set. That's what we have but you need to give each of the servers uh, tables of just their observations. So you don't want each of them to see each other's tables, but you just want each of them to see their own. So I wanna show you an option under the tables menu for subsetting your data set on the basis of a column. And this is actually useful for just that situation. You need to provide data to individuals based on sort of some characteristic in the data set. And a subset in general lets you do a lot of things. You can subset uh, rows you have selected or columns you have selected. So you can actually make the selections then pop out that part of the data set. Uh, you can create linked subsets. So pop out part of the data set, but have that subset actually update the original table if you make changes. And you have some other options here. What I'm gonna do is go to all rows, all columns, leave that there, but tell it to subset by a variable. And by and jump usually means subset on the basis of the levels of some other variable. And so I'm gonna go to server. And what I'm telling jump with this setup is break apart this full data set on the basis of servers. And so when I hit OK, I'm gonna get three data sets, one for server A, one for server B, and one for server C. And so these can be saved out and given to my servers because it only has their data. And so that's a handy way to do it. And this works uh, you know, for anything you wanna do in jump or even multiple columns you select. Now let's imagine that these are the only data sets you have. You have server A, B, and C. And you wanna go the other direction. You know, I want to recombine these three different data sets together to have a master data set because maybe I want to do analyses that are across server. And remember in Jump, you have to have data in the same data set in order to do that. So the reverse operation of this subsetting is to concatenate. So concatenation brings together those rows from the different tables. And so let's see how this works. So I'm going to remove everything here just so we have it empty. My open data tables are A, B, and C. I can select them add them to the data tables to be concatenated. 
Now, I want to do something specific here. I'm actually going to tell Jump to create a source column. That is, to create a column in this new data set that says where the data came from. And you'll see what this does. When I hit OK, it's going to create a data set just like the original data set, except it has one additional column now. It says source table was server equals A, server equals B, server equals C. And I like to always do that as sort of a general practice. Whenever you use tables concatenate, make sure to cr uh, check that box, create a source column, just so you always have it in there. You can always delete it, uh, but the nice thing is you always know where the data came from originally. So subsetting based on the variable, that's one way to get to these three tables. And then concatenating is the way of bringing them back together. And so those are pretty typical operations when you're actually working with data from multiple sources. Now, another issue is, let's actually look at a sample data set we have in the sample data directory. These are US demographics, and we have lots of interesting information here. Income, IQ, region of the country, population. Then we have lots of characteristics of each state. So vegetable consumption, smokers, physical activity. You know, my suspicion is that this data set did not start off, or nobody collected all these individually. These data were combined from many different sources. In fact, we may have had a situation that looked like this, where we had several data sets. One that was based on uh, basics of the state, so the state with IQ, region, population, maybe latitude and longitude. Uh, another data set that was just attributes, so gross state product, vegetable consumption, smokers. Ones that were based on education. So eighth grade math, high school graduates, college degrees, and then just a, a small data set based on income. And so right now, these are columns that are in several different data sets, but all with the same rows. So notice this is a slightly different situation than a concatenation. This is a situation where we need to join tables together. And so I want to show you the operation we'll use for that. So again, under the tables menu. And we can actually do a couple different things. We can either use join or update. Now, I'm going to use update for this one, but join is actually another way to do this. And just to peek at it, what join lets you do is, is just like update, but we can do a sort of a more complicated uh, selections here. So join will ask us, you know, which table do we want to join with basics? And we could say join income. And what we're going to be doing is essentially giving a link between the tables, so matching with them. And notice that join gives you a lot of option here, how you want to drop multiples, include non-matches, uh, lots of other things. So we're going to look at join in maybe a different webinar. For us, let's do something kind of basic. So under tables, we can use this update option. And what update is principally made to do is if you have a table that, let's say, has some data like population, and you get a new table from somebody that has updated data on population for each state, uh, what update can do is update this population column with the data from the new data table. So it, it allows you a way to kind of change the values based on some new data that came in. Now, update is also really useful when you want to add columns from another data set and on the basis of some matching criterion. So in this case, let's update basics from data with income first. And I'm going to tell Jump I want to match columns. That is in each data set, so between uh, income and basics, so here's income here, the column that matches between these two, the one that is the identity so that we know where to put the rows, is state. So I'll select state in the basics data set here, state in the income data set here, and click match. And since I have under add columns from update table, I have all selected. What it's going to do is any column that's not in the basics data set, it will add to the basics data set. So watch what happens. When I click OK, I now have household income actually in this data set. So I can close this one. Now I'm going to do the next one kind of quickly because it's just the same thing. Tables, update. I want to update basics with education, matching columns, state by state. I have add columns from data tape using all. Click OK. Now it's added those. Let's do the last one. Let's do education. So with basics selected, tables, update. I want to update with education, match columns, state by state, match, OK. And now what we have is our final data set, just like we started with, the one that has all those columns based on the original matching criterion, so based on state. And so that's a pretty common procedure we have to do, taking data from multiple sources. Sometimes it's multiple columns from different sources, and sometimes it's multiple rows from different sources. All right, so that's some subsetting and merging. And finally, I want to show you some operations for reshaping your data sets. So we can do this one fairly quickly. So stacking, splitting, and tabulating. Now, sometimes your data set comes in a format like this. So you have observations for uh, individual units in your analysis. So the IDs here are different dogs. But we have observations, let's say, across four different time points. So histamine levels across uh, four different time points measured for these dogs. Now, just to keep ourselves kind of clear, I'm going to delete some extra rows out of our data set. 
our extra columns out of our data set, and let's just focus on these ones. Now, what if instead of having uh, four different columns for these four different time points, we wanted those four different time points to be four different rows labeled by ID? So we'd actually have four rows in the data set with ID 1. Now, that operation is called stacking. So if I go to the tables menu and go to stack, what stack asks us is which columns would we like to now be represented as rows in the data set? And what I'm going to do is select those four time points, histamine at time 0, 1, 3, and 5. And what I can do is just put them in the stack column sections. And actually, there's nothing else I need to change yet. So I'm going to click Keep Dialog Open and hit Create so you can see what happens really by keeping everything out of the default. And I want you to see how these two data sets match up. So on the left-hand side, notice we have the histamine levels 0, 1, 3, and 5 across the row for the first individual in the second data set, ID 1, that first dog, has four rows, and the label column is the title of each original column, and the data column are the data points in each original row. And so what we've done is we've just restructured that there's non-destructive here. We have actually haven't uh, destroyed any data or removed any data. We've simply moved it such that it's reflected across rows, which means the original 16 rows in our data set is now 64 rows times four. Right? We have four rows for every original one row. Now, the reason I had Keep Dialog open is because we can actually set what we want to call these new columns. So instead of just calling them data and label, label should probably be time. That's the time points that those columns represent. And the data is actually histamine levels. And notice now when I create this, it makes them labeled a little bit better. So time point 0, 1 through 5, and histamine levels that were actually in the data set. And so that's called stacking. Stacking is creating a data set that had originally multiple columns. You want to be multiple rows. Let's do the reverse operation, splitting a data set. So taking a data set like this, where you have multiple rows representing multiple characteristics, and we want them to go backwards, making a data set that they're represented across columns. Well, we can do this. It's under tables, and it's under split. Split meaning split those rows into columns. And here we just have to say what we're splitting by, what characteristic reflects the different columns. That's time. The split column, or columns, the things that we want to actually create across. So histamine levels were the things we wanted to be multiple columns before. So let's give it histamine. And then what we want to group these observations by. And so things like ID. Now, we have an option here. Do we want to keep the remaining columns we haven't used, like DEP1 and drug? I'm going to say we want to keep those as well. So we actually retain them in the data set. And let me hit OK, and we get back to the original data set. And so here we are, just like the original one, with ID, drug, and, morph or drug and DEP1, and now our four rows now represented across columns. So we can do this infinitely. So these are non-destructive transformations of our data. We've simply been restructuring and moving data points around, so splitting and stacking. Now the final thing I want to show you is, is actually a destructive transformation. That is a transformation that will eliminate uh, your ability to recover the individual information. And this is a situation, and I'll orient you to the data set rather quickly. We have eight observations for each state here because what we have are observations taken for scores on at the SAT over years. But if we want to do a simple regression, let's say between ACT scores and SAT scores, um, and we don't want to do anything complicated, we need to aggregate or tabulate over these eight years. And so this is something we'll do under the Analyze menu, under Tabulate. And Tabulate, uh, we show in other webinars, is a great drag and drop interface for creating uh, tables out of your data. In this situation, it's especially useful because what we want is for every uh, state, we want an average of those SAT scores, so averaging over a year. So let me show you what this looks like. I'll take state and do a drop zone for row. The first thing it shows us is the number of observations we have for each state. Well, we have eight of them. And we want to actually take something like, let's do SAT total. I'll grab these two, right click, combine, and make a sum. Remember, that was our instant formula. I'll take that and drop it on top of n. It's taking the sum across all those eight observations. Let's replace that with the mean, so dragging on top of there. And now let's take another variable. Let's say we wanted to correlate it with salary. So I'll take salary and drag it to the little drop zone to the right here. And so right to the right of SAT total. And now, if I go to the red triangle and make this into a data table, I have a data set that's an aggregation of those different observations. So now we actually have just the mean for each. And notice that this is destructive. We can't go backwards here and recover the original data.